Miss me? We're going to finish up the week and our topic of how women are portrayed in art with a look at selected works from African art and art of the indigenous Americas. If we'd made it through our global contemporary unit, you'd have already heard about the theory of the male gaze, that most women are depicted in cinema and art as seen through men's eyes, that is, as objects of desire and as objects of possession. It's an interesting and sometimes persuasive theory, although I think it way oversimplifies the artistic intentions of artists such as Titian and Angra. And if you're wondering where I found this image, it's from an Atlantic article entitled Jane Austen and the Rise of the Female Gaze. I'm a huge Jane Austen fan, and I completely agree that she observed men through a magnifying glass closely and insightfully not unlike the way Rachel Roish observed bugs on flowers. But I also like the point, echoed by our college board lecturer, that we see the world from a female perspective in works as early as the portrait of Sorwana, which was painted by a man, but very much under Sorwana's direction, and Elizabeth Vigée Le Brun's charming, assertive self-portrait. In fact, we encountered this idea the first day of the course when we compared two paintings of the same subject, painted in the same city and in the same art historical period, Italian Baroque. Didn't Artemisia Gentileschi, the raped teenager who went on to earn fame and fortune as a painter, bring a female gaze to her work? I'll admit I'm a little uncomfortable with an overarching generalization that men look at the world narrowly and brutishly, while women look at it widely and compassionately, but the point surely stands that gender is one of the many filters through which we both create and view art. So, think for example of the comparison between Venus of Urbino's modest, slightly downcast eyes and Olympia's forthright gaze. So what I'd like to do today is to extend our discussion of how women are portrayed in art to works from Africa and, in the second part of this podcast, the indigenous Americas. To what extent does the analytical concept of male and female gaze translate to these cultures? So let's start with a work that we last looked at back in the late fall, that is, back before the world turned upside down. Here's some intriguing information from the Smithsonian Museum of African Art, uh, which houses this work. The original Chakwe name, Puo, referred to an adult woman who had given birth. The more recent name, Moana Puo, was probably adopted under European influences, and it emphasizes youthful feminine beauty. So the primary meaning of the work is its association with fertility, the association with youthful beauty, the term Moana refers to potential, may have come later and from cultural influences outside the Chakwe people. At any rate, we've seen references to fertility in art before. Although our discussion of the Tlatilco, Tlatilco, sorry, female figurine focused more on its expression of important Mesoamerican concept of dualism, we also noted that she, like the prehistoric Venuses I've stuck in on this slide, is well endowed, especially around the hips, ready for birth in those babies. It's also interesting that all of these figures, like the Po mask, have had highly elaborate hairdos. And while the Tlatilco figurine was found in a tomb, similar figurines have been found not only in tombs, but in open fields. They may have been sown or ritually buried in the four corners of cornfields, again, suggesting a connection with fertility. Back to the pole mask. Let's practice our visual description skills. What do you see? How does this culture come to define female beauty? Use your art history vocabulary. The face is symmetrical often an attribute of beauty, an oval or oblong with a slightly pointed chin. The forehead is high, which is often used in art to signify intelligence. The nose is long, thin, and narrow, stylized in a way that resembles Byzantine art, although, of course, the cultures would not have had contact over space and time. The eyes are almond-shaped and prominent, but also shut. The mouth is likewise tightly closed. Our Khan Academy expert suggests that the closed eyes and mouth signify that the woman is turning inward. To quote from the Khan Academy video, she's not talking because she doesn't need to talk. At this point in her life, she deserves respect. She doesn't have to open her eyes wide, she's already knowing. And indeed, the paint around her eyes may suggest a kind of second sight that comes from enduring and surviving childbirth. And all of this may be right. I am by no means an expert and the Khan Academy art historians are. 
but it does strike me that a silent woman with eye, averted eyes and a closed mouth is also a model of a submissive woman. Note too that we see ornamental scarification, jewelry, and an elaborate hairstyle. Clearly ornamentation was part of this culture's and many cultures' concepts of beauty. We gain more insight when we consider how this mask is used in performance, for like so much African art, this is not a work meant to be stared at in a museum. So here's some information I picked up on the Sotheby website. Because they follow matrilineal descent, the Chakwe dance pro to honor the founding female ancestor of the lineage. A male dancer is dressed like a woman in a costume of braided fiber that completely covers his body and hides his identity. He wears a loincloth, carries a fan, and moves in slow, precise steps to emulate a woman. Quo dances are characterized by short steps and sensuous hip movements, which are emphasized by a bustle tied around the hips that consists of a bundle of cloth, strings, and rattling objects. The Puebo dance may enact sexual behaviors by pretending to have intercourse with a mortar or the figure that she forms from earth in the performance space. These dances are a type of sex education, presented openly to stress the fertility of this female ancestor. Puevo, that's the name of the dance, may also honor women as providers by dancing with a fishing basket or pretending to pound corn inside a mortar. I'm sure you're relieved to know that I'm maintaining my R rating. The article continues. Although Puevo, that's the dancer actually, represents a woman and a female role model, she is created by men and performs in events related to male initiation. The dance is intended to instruct young men on what they should look for in a wife. Women accept this male concept of the ideal female if they feel the performance honors them, but they may chase away a performer whom they feel is not up to their standards. In fact, the best female dancers in the community often dance alongside the pueblo to test the skills of the female impersonator. So, we end up with a really fascinating and complicated gender dynamic that kind of defies the various labels. Women are honored as mothers, providers, and ancestors, and yes, as objects of beauty. Men perform the ceremony to instruct other men in what to look for in the women they will, in some sense, possess. But women also assert a role in the ceremony. Let's turn to our second required work. Blow masks do not always represent women, but we know that this one is honoring the woman we see in the photo below. Blow masks appeared in the final sequence of large-scale public festivals. Blow performances consist of a succession of dances that culminate in tributes to the community's most distinguished members. Obviously, that can include women. Individuals honored in this way are depicted by a mask that is conceived as their artistic double or namesake. The max masks themselves, however, are highly stylized. They aren't intended to represent the honoree's actual appearance. And this strikes me as quite similar in function to the pro mask. Again, while women may be depicted, it's the men who dance. There doesn't, however, seem to be the same link to fertility. At least I didn't see a mention of it. I was so struck by the visual similarities of these works that I hunted around on the internet to see if there were established relations between these two cultures despite their significant geographical separation. Nope, not that I found, although interestingly both the Baule and the Chakwe people are matrilineal. But we certainly see some similarities in their concept of beauty. The oval symmetrical faces, the narrow elongated and triangular noses, the high forehead, small ears and mouths, and scarification of the temple. The abstract headdress on the blow mask is designed to imitate horns. It is not, in fact, a hairstyle. The triangular shapes on the forehead and cheeks were intended to catch the light during performance. Another point I should have made about the pro mask as well is that the high sheen of the mask, its patina, to use a term, shows healthy, youthful skin, another emblem of beauty. And of course, it is black or deeply dark skin, which is how these cultures define beautiful. So I couldn't find a, a photograph of a performance with an umblo mask, but here's what the Khan Academy article on this work says about the performance. Notice that Moya Yanso's portrait mask is in the hands of her stepson in the photograph. Masking is the prerogative of men. While women attend masquerades as audience members and can perform with masked dancers, they do not own or wear masks themselves. The performers and makers of masks, as well as those who commission them, are always men. 
So again, we see interesting and complex gender dynamics that kind of defy stereotypes. Bundu masks, our third mask depiction of women, differ in two important ways from the Puo and Mblo masks. First, they are actually worn by women, and indeed they are part of an all-female initiation ceremony from which men are excluded. Young women at the stage of puberty spend three months secluded in the forest learning the secrets of womanhood. By the way, the initiation rites included female genital mutilation, which has come, un come under considerable, in my view, deserved criticism by advocates of women's rights. I should add that the masks were carved by men. The second more important difference between this mask and the other two that we've just examined is it seems to present a very different aesthetic of beauty. There are similarities. The high, dark gloss or patina, the high forehead, small eyes and mouth, and a shorter but still somewhat triangular nose. On the two non-required examples of Bundu masks that I've included in the slide, we see scarification. All have highly elaborate headdresses and a suggestion of elaborate hairdos as well. As Dr. Perry Clem noted in the Khan Academy video, the downcast eyes suggest that she should be reserved. The small mouth suggests she should keep her mouth closed and not gossip, gossip being the most dangerous thing in a small society in many cases, then small ears so as not to listen to that gossip. But the slender and to Western eyes refined appearance of the Puo and Blow masks are replaced by a face that is undeniably plump and resting on top of three even plumper rings of fat. These are symbols of the young woman's physical readiness to assume the risks of childbirth. So again, we see a shout out to fertility. The shape of the neck may also be a reference to a chrysalis, who has not yet emerged as a butterfly, just as these young women have not yet emerged into full womanhood. And again, that is defined as motherhood. With our final African work, we see a somewhat different image and contextualization of the female role. In the veranda post sculpture, hierarchical scale is used to mark the high status of the senior wife. She crowns the king and protects him during his reign. The junior wife, you'll note, is much smaller, my guess, as she got bossed around. It's not as clear that this work is meant to depict an ideal of female beauty as opposed to female power and social status. We see the ovoid face and the high forehead again, probably signifying intelligence. The senior wife's eyes are also downcast toward her husband, but by contrast with the other figures, they are bulging and wide. According to our Khan Academy experts, the Yoruba believed that women were especially open to communication with and possession by ancestral spirits, and that's what the bulging eyes signify. And here are some further comments from Khan Academy. The senior wife displays a once common practice in the Akiti region of filing the front teeth as a sign of beauty and rank. Her elaborate hairstyle would reflect one worn during a festival honoring a deity or during a chief's installation. On her back, see this here, Aloe has replicated the queen's striking scarification patterns that are associated with her community and high status. In my next podcast, I'm going to compare this to a work of the indigenous Americas and then dash through some of our other required works.